Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this first of lots of lessons on basic economic concepts. I am Ms. Jennifer Blank, and I will be your guide on this journey. As you see on this title page, I've got uh, several different quotes that I want you to take a look at. But feel free to pause the video and just kind of read the quotes and, and kind of get an idea of, of what these things mean to you, because as you move through uh, economics content, these quotes will have a great deal more meaning. So key topics for chapter one, uh, this basic economic concepts unit is going to cover three different chapters. So part one of chapter one is going to be what is economics? We're going to talk about the key ideas of scarcity and choice and opportunity cost. Part two, we're going to talk about the factors of production, physical versus human capital and entrepreneurship. And then in parts three and four, we're going to deal with marginal analysis, this idea of thinking at the margin. And we're going to introduce our first real economics model, the production possibilities curve. The focus questions for chapter one that I want you to keep in mind, this big picture question is how can we make the best economic choices possible? All right, that's really what the big overarching question that we're going to explore. But there are three other key questions I want you to keep in mind that, that factor into that big question. So key question number one, how does scarcity force people to make economic choices? Number two, how does opportunity cost affect decision making? And number three, how does a nation decide what and how much to produce? So these are the key questions that we're going to be focusing on throughout chapter one. So keep those in mind. Now, for this lesson, we're going to learn the definition of economics, of scarcity, of opportunity cost, and we're also going to compare micro and macro economics. The uh, economics happens in or, or, uh, is in two branches. You have the macro, which is big picture, and the micro, which is small picture. But we're going to explore that in a little bit more detail as we go forward. All right, so what exactly is economics? Well, there are several definitions out there, but they all pretty much amount to the same thing. So the first one I have up there is economics is a study of how people make choices in an attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants with scarce or limited resources. Another option, it's a study of how people choose to use their scarce resources in an attempt to satisfy their unlimited wants, very similar. And it's the study of how individuals, families, businesses, and societies use limited resources to fulfill their unlimited wants. So it's all basically boiling down to the same thing. Economics studies choice. And we must make choices because there are limited, there's limited stuff that we have, and we have all of these wants that are unlimited. All right, so what, are, what is scarcity and choice? What is this stuff? What is this all about? Scarce economic resources means there are limited goods and services. We don't have an unlimited amount of all the stuff that we want and that we need. Okay, there's a limit to it. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Tin Stoffel, you'll see the little acronym right there, Tin Stoffel. There is no such thing as a free lunch. Someone somewhere is paying for what you just got for free. Nothing is actually free in society. Resources cost someone something. It may, it may not have cost you anything, but someone at some point had to pay for what you got for free. It's a very, very important concept. Tin Stoffel. An opportunity cost. To obtain more of one thing, society foregoes the opportunity of getting the next best thing. And this is the opportunity cost of the choice. I know the definition is a little bit cut off down there. But it's the next best thing that you could get. So you want this one thing. What is the second option that you would give up in order to get that one thing? All right, that's what opportunity cost is. Here's some quotes, a little quote about economics, which is incredibly entertaining. And I think particularly after learning government, you will find this interesting. The first lesson of economics is scarcity. There is never enough of anything to satisfy all those who want it. The first lesson of politics is to disregard the first lesson of economics. So now, ladies and gentlemen, you should see why we have the situation that we have, because People, voters do not like to hear, wait, that's scarce. I can't have it. What do you mean I can't have it? But that guy over there is getting it and I want it now. No, well, no, no, no. Politics, you have to promise everything to everyone because that's how you get people to vote for you. But of course, you can't do that. Economics says you can't because there's never enough of anything to satisfy all those who want it. But in politics, if you're honest about that, you don't get elected. And so this is why we have the situation we have. Scarcity. All right, there's a nice big little icon, big little picture, picture graph there for you. So on the on the um, left hand side, you see land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. Those are 
factors of production, okay? Now, we're going to learn about factors of production in a lot more detail later, but that's the stuff. Those are the resources we have to make other stuff and to function. And then on the right-hand side, you see, these are all the wants that we have, the wants and needs, and they're virtually unlimited. So uh, we have to use these things on the left to produce all of these things. So after a while, stuff's going to run out, okay? All right, so the impact of scarcity is important, and I, I can't possibly overemphasize this idea. So needs and wants are unlimited, okay? But resources, goods, and services are scarce. Because of this, we have to make trade-offs and identify what the opportunity costs are of those trade-offs. Now, for individuals, you make personal trade-offs, time and money, and you make decisions at the margin. We'll talk more about what that means in a little bit. The impact on businesses, they have to balance the factors of production. How much of each do they have, land, labor, capital, and how much of those things are they going to use? They have to identify marginal costs and benefits of producing a product or keeping an employee or hiring more employees. All right. Now, the impact on nations is bigger. All right. They have to make budgetary trade-offs. Okay. Guns or butter is a common example you see in economics. And because they have to make trade-offs, they have to do this thing called the production possibilities uh, model. Okay. And they use that to determine those trade-offs. Now, to put it another way, just to make sure that we're all on the same page and we all get this, economics examines how individuals institutions, and society make choices because of scarcity. Scarcity is the limited amount of stuff that people want or need. How, and so the complete definition is how individuals, institutions, and society makes choices because the stuff that people want or need is only available in limited amounts. And economists do this. They study this by establishing things called theories, right? We've all heard the term theories, but let's talk about what that means in economics. So you start up here at the top of this little chart. You start with the scientific method. And at, with, with the scientific method, you're running experiments, right? And you, you, you try things out. Uh, and that leads to economic theories. These theories need to be tested with the scientific method. And those conclusions lead to economic principles, all right? And those principles lead to economic models. Economic models enable economists to make predictions, and those predictions then need to be tested with the scientific method. So it's a cycle that starts and ends with the scientific method. It never actually really stops. Economists are constantly experimenting and testing the theories that they have. <clears throat> So what is the scientific method? This should be a review. I'm going to go through this real quick. you got to observe real-world behavior and outcomes. So you figure this out by using observations and data. When you combine those two together, you get a hypothesis. Okay. You then need to test the hypothesis by comparing it to other outcomes. You accept, reject, and modify your hypothesis as you experiment because it's going to change based on what your new data tells you. You continue the testing process. And when you have enough positive results, that gets you an economic theory, all right? And then that economic theory, when, it, when it's tested enough, can lead you to an economic principle, which is a generalization, all right? And a generalization is a statement about economic behavior or the economy that enables the prediction of the probable effects of certain actions, all right? So economic principles are generalizations that relate to economic behavior, okay? They're based on the tendencies of the typical consumer, worker, or business. Obviously, there are exceptions to these things, but when if you want to make predictions, you have to try to isolate as many variables as you can. So when you have an economic principle and then another economic principle, that gives you an economic model. And a model is a simplified representation of how something works. This is how economists do their stuff. This is how they figure it out. They use models. Something I really want you to keep in mind, this is very important. This is called the other things equal assumption. In Latin, ceteris paribus, other things equal assumption. Economists must assume that factors other than those being considered do not change. So all variables, except the specific one or two that the economist is studying, has to remain constant. It's essential for economists to do this because they can't make predictions without it. There are so many variables to think about that if you try to think about all of them at the exact same time, it would be impossible to make predictions. So you have to isolate what you're trying to study and assume that other things remain constant. This is very, very important. There are a lot of assumptions in economics that you have to make in order to predict. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward. All right, so I just wanted to reiterate this chart. Remember, we start with the scientific method, gets us to theories, 
that those theories need to be tested. Those conclusions lead to economic principles, which then leads to an economic model. Those models allow economists to make predictions, and those predictions then need to be retested via the scientific method. Remember this. This is how economics works, okay? These are some typical assumptions in economic models. You can feel free um, to pause this, to just take a look at it. I'm not going to read this for you. You can pause the video and take a look at it yourself. But it's interesting, and it might kind of throw you for a loop because you're like, we're assuming a lot. Like, this is not real world stuff. Like, this is not what happens in the real world. How do econ economists make, make predictions at all that have, that have any useful effect based on these predictions? This is not the real world. But as you go through economics, you will see, as you learn more about the content, you will see that these assumptions are necessary and that the, production, the predictions that come out of those assumptions actually are very effective. So I just want you to keep this in mind. All right, graphical expression. All economic models are graphed. Okay, so if you have an issue with graphs, come and see me. I can help you, but you better know how to graph some stuff because you're going to be doing a lot of graphing. All right, it, it's a, a very, very heavy emphasis and focus on graphing. And these graphs are meant to help us visualize and understand relationships between economic concepts. Um, a graph is basically a visual representation of the relationship between two variables. All of our graphs will contain an X and Y axis, um, and you need to remember to label your graphs on all work for this class. If you don't label, you get a zero. I'm not going to grade it. You have to label. Your graph means nothing if it's not labeled. So it's very, very important. Please remember that. All right. Difference between micro and macro. Micro is concerned with individual units in an economy. All right. It's details of an economic unit, very small segments of the economy, like an individual business, the market for an individual business, or an individual's tax return. Macroeconomics is very different. It's concerned with the economy as a whole. It's concerned with the basic subdivisions. A subdivision is known as an aggregate. And an aggregate is a collection of specific economic units treated as if they were one. So macroeconomics doesn't look at the employment, unemployment of one person. They look at the unemployment of the entire country. And that's how we get the unemployment rate. So they calculate all the people that are unemployed and lump them into one thing to study the entire economy. That's very important. So here's a little graphic for you to let you know what this is. So you see macroeconomics, then there's micro. This is what's in micro, concerned with individual units, details of a specific economic unit, and small segments of the economy. By contrast, macro is concerned with the economy as a whole, okay? They're concerned with basic subdivisions, and they focus on aggregates. Microeconomics will be our focus for the semester. Okay, the goals of micro are to, one, identify the forces that make markets work, two, look at the results of market behavior, and three, apply supply and demand to real-world situations. As I said before, we're going to be dealing with the smaller picture. So we're going to take a look at price theory, which you don't know what that is, but don't worry, you'll learn. An analysis of the principal forces that determine allocation of resources. So we're going to look at how and why resources go to what people and what stuff in society. Why and how do we make the choices we make as a nation, an individual business or corporation, as individual people? We're going to look at individual units of an economy or market, and we're going to take a look at equity versus efficiency. And these two things are both values of America, but they very often come into conflict. So we're going to explore how we try to reconcile that as a nation and how people do that as individuals. Macroeconomics, again, like I said, it's an overview outline of the structure of the economy. It, it, it looks at relationships between major aggregates. So it's big picture, total output, total employment, total income, and a general level of prices as opposed to a specific business, output of a specific business, employment of a specific person or small industry, uh, individual income, and a specific price for a specific good. And that's the end of part one. I hope you all learned what you needed to, and I will see you next time. Come to class prepared with questions.